Okay, guys, welcome back. We had a 90-minute discussion about the sharing economy earlier from a more academic perspective. We talked about a couple of practical examples. I can also now point to Inken, who is finally here. Inken, I talked about your research a lot in the session before. <laughs> so if you have any questions about the research that I told you about, uh, approach Inken later. She is the expert. So now, as I told you, we have a guest lecturer. We actually have a bonus today. We have two guest lecturers. Like in the lecture before, you had two lecturers, Jenny and me. <laughs> now you even get two guest lecturers today. So Carsten, um, Carsten Hahn from SAP, Director of Innovation and Technology at SAP, and Christian, who will tell us a little bit more about his background, um, probably also in a minute. Um, I met Carsten quite some time, a couple of months ago at SAP, and I said I wanted to invite him here to the classroom. He has uh, an interesting mixture because he's not only a practitioner, but also an academic. So he can really build the bridge between these two topics and talk a little bit about um, really the sharing economy, innovative business models, and how they fit into the context of um, CSR, but also he's going to show us that it's not only a topic for CSR, but also a much broader topic um, of innovation at SAP. So I thank you very much for being here. I'm very much looking forward uh, to what you're going to tell us. Thank you both for being here. The stage is yours. One, two, one, two. Does it work? Yes. All right. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's always an honor uh, being at the University of Mannheim because I'm also an alumni of uh, Mannheim. So I did my graduation here in, uh, in the last century, actually. Uh, it's already a long time ago. It was in 1998. Uh, when I was in those uh, rooms here and it was different here. So it's, it's quite improving here at uh, University of Mannheim. And you might know that the roof here is uh, sponsored or not sponsored, donated by the founder of SAP. So Hasso Plattner uh, donated about 10 million uh, seven, eight years ago so that you get a roof here on top of your, uh, of your castle. Um, actually, I, I was not in uh, business administration. I was in Wirtschaftsinformatik. So, so um, after I graduated, uh, I did my PhD, uh, by the way, in marketing, marketing science, which was uh, not usual for a Wirtschaftsinformatiker. Normally, you are doing your PhD in logistics and stuff like that. But I did it uh, in uh, marketing science in, in the US uh, because uh, 20, 25 years ago here, we had no Christian Homburg here at uh, Mannheim. And it was uh, not just in Mannheim, but uh, overall in Germany, a kind of diaspora of, of marketing. So I had to go to the US to do my PhD there. And after my PhD, I, I went to SAP. So I'm already since 18 years at SAP. And um, we, I started as an assistant to the board member, which is an, an, interesting, an interesting starting point to do your career in, in a big company. So highly recommended if you want to start your career in a big company, do it uh, as an assistant to the board member, because then you get to know the company very, very fast uh, uh, in an end-to-end in a, uh, manner. And you get a great network. And uh, the, the board member was uh, responsible for development. And that's the reason why I did my, my whole career uh, in development. I'm still in development. As you can see, I'm not in sales. So if I would be in sales, I would wear a suit. But uh, we are developers, and we are wearing that what we like. And uh, that's where I'm still in. I'm in innovation and technology, or technology and innovation. Um, we are thinking of the next five to 10 years of SAP success. And uh, we are doing that in a quite startup-like way. So we are so-called intrapreneurs. Um, we, are, we have an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, we need to, to fight for our budgets. It's, it's hard, uh, so you don't get uh, the money uh, without any effort. And we have to fight for our projects, but uh, that helps a lot. So this kind of entrepreneurial mindset, uh, I thought I should also give to others. And that's the reason 
why I started five years ago my second role as a part-time professor at the University of Applied Science in Karlsruhe for innovation and entrepreneurship. And I, I recognized very quickly that um, in the students' uh, community, there are many, many ideas which are belonging to sharing economy. And I want to share my experiences today, not just from SAP point of view, but also from the university point of view. And that's the reason why I asked Christian to, to join me today. Uh, Christian is uh, one of my assistants at the University of Applied Science, and uh, he's even also a founder um, of a co-founder of an, a new startup called Heldenruf, and he will um, uh, present that afterwards. So you will get some examples uh, of sharing economy out of SAP and also some examples out of our applied research results uh, at the University of Applied Science in Karlsruhe. Um, in principle, and I need the clicker here, in principle a sharing economy is often connected to CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, and uh, I will also start with some standard slides of our Corporate Social Responsibility Group. And uh, I will, in addition to that, show you what happens in development and also in our uh, product portfolio, uh, which has a connection or a context to sharing economy. So my, my main message is sharing economy is not just something which has a social aspect sharing economy is much, much more. And you will see that. Uh, in addition to that, I will show you also some principles of uh, the platform economy, because many, many sharing economy approaches are platform-based approaches. And that's also what we are investigating at SAP. How can we increase the number of platforms uh, in, in business, and uh, we have some, some principles there, and I will share that uh, with you guys. So who doesn't know SAP? Okay, now I'll prove you. Um, what is the market capitalization of SAP? Well, it's, it's a good guess. It's actually, as of today, 133.35. So our share price increased. Um, what is the share price? No, what is the market cap of, uh, for example, BASF? Does somebody know? Just to get a, a reference. So it's 56. And SAP is um, the most valued company in terms of share price or market capitalization uh, in Germany. Uh, we are very proud of that. However, um, if you compare that to our big gorillas and competitors like Google, Apple, and uh, yeah, Google, Apple, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. Microsoft has a market cap of almost one trillion, is it then? So 1,000 billion. And uh, uh, Google, 750 billion. Apple, 840 around. So compared to those, which is IT companies, uh, SAP has much room of improvement to really increase the market cap, and we are working on that. So just to give you a glimpse of uh, SAP, in addition to that, here are some facts. We are founded almost 50 years ago. Um, we are founded in Mannheim, by the way. So the first office was in, in Mannheim. Uh, we have almost uh, 100,000 uh, employees worldwide, although we um, we have now also a decrease, a short decrease of 5,000. Uh, we will end up at, until end of this year uh, with 100,000. We serve more than 400,000 customers in more than 180 uh, countries. And now uh, I, I like those facts. So um, the, uh, the SAP customers include 92% of the Forbes Global 2000 companies, so almost Every big company has SAP, which is actually not bad, uh, also for our, for our sales guys, because we have a, a, a great customer base. 98% of the 100 most value brands uh, are our uh, customers. And by the way, our brand uh, has also a, a high value 
does somebody know according to Interbrand? So it's our, just our brand is a value of 22 billion, 22 billion. So um, that's, that's the facts of SAP, and 78% uh, uh, of the world's food uh, are produced uh, from our customers. 82% of the world's med medical devices are uh, produced uh, from our customers. And also very interesting, 77% of the world's transactions revenue touches an SAP system. So if you buy something in the App Store of Apple, then your transaction goes via an SAP system in the back end because Apple is a good customer of us and also partner. So just to give you a glimpse, what is SAP doing all about and what is our business? Our, our purpose is we help the world run better and improves people's lives. So classical uh, purpose, uh, our promise is we innovate to help our customers run at their best so I hope I can prove that this is not just a marketing slide, but that we also practice that with our examples I will give you later on. Um, we have a, a vision and purpose in the line with the uh, uh, UN's two uh, 2030 vision. Uh, you, you may know those 17 uh, goals. And we also said, okay, let's take those goals and let's focus on specific aspects uh, on those goals uh, and as it's uh, written there SAP is playing a proactive part in the public private collaboration on the journey to improve that. Uh, our uh, CEO Bill McDermott uh, said at the World Economic Forum last year we are trying to role model the importance of each individual and their skill set having a place in the new economy. So it's still maybe some marketing hopefully you will later on uh, um, be convinced that we are not just doing that. So now the, ah, no, it's, it's working. Now, um, these are some standard slides from the CSR department. So it's not my slides, but I asked them uh, to give me those slides so that I give, can give you a complete view with regards to sharing economy and, and CSR activities uh, from SAP. So the, the mission of our uh, corporate social responsibility group is powering opportunity through digital inclusion. And the digital inclusion is uh, uh, relevant and important and you might know all right, uh, already those, those facts that uh, we have uh, people who, who cannot read, uh, we have uh, people who are excluded from the uh, digital economy and these are 60% of the world's population uh, we have um, really room for improvement to increase the digital skills um, globally. And uh, that's the reason, uh, the reason why we said, okay, digital inclusion is, uh, is really our mission. Um, the focus areas of our CSR activities are building digital skills, accelerating nonprofits and social enterprises to be best run, and also connecting employees with purpose. And we are doing that really with a, a small group of, of CSR, like in, in many other companies. CSR group is uh, a, a very often a small group, a small budget. And uh, if the company needs to, uh, to look on costs, then very often the CSR group is the group who needs to give their budgets off. Uh, it's, it's really hard work. And uh, you can imagine we get many, many, many requests from outside, please help us, we, uh, we need some help. But nevertheless, we, we try to find the right projects which have some impact and not just, okay, we do something and then we can talk about that uh, in, in, uh, in, in social media. So one is uh, to build up the digital skills. We have, for example, um, um, the first Lego League um, and the facts in, in 2017 was uh, that more than 700 children participated, uh, uh, 115 teams supported by SAP, and uh, we have really uh, uh, five areas in the so-called MEE, which is Middle East Europe. So Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, and Ukraine. What is not on the slide and what I supported, by the way, also as a, a judge, was um, the, the World Robot Olympiad, which was very similar to the first Lego League. Uh, it was uh, two years ago uh, where the World Robot Olympiad, which is also sponsored by, by Lego, um, had the challenge, how can we manage the waste? 
the waste in our oceans. So it's about the plastic in our oceans. And I was so impressed what the people, and, and it was uh, 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 groups of young people from 14 to 24, what they provided as solutions to really get rid of those plastic what we have in the oceans. And it was that impressive. It was in, in Delhi, the, the final uh, round was in Delhi, and we had really about 100 different uh, groups all over the world, from Iranian, from uh, um, uh, Syria, um, uh, from Germany, of course. Uh, the the G German group had an interesting idea. They came from Neustadt on the Rheinstraße here, very close by. And they had a robot which is collecting on his own on, on beaches plastic. And it was a, a, a kind of um, a crowd approach uh, because they had no, not just have one robot but many and they talked to each other. So uh, the idea was uh, a ship is going from outside to a beach which is covered with plastic and the ship is just sending the robots uh, to the beach and then the, the robots are doing the stuff on their own and then they go back to the ship. So that you can, without any uh, people involved, you can really um, clean those beaches and we are not talking about the beaches of Mallorca, we are talking about the, the beaches in Africa which, which is very hard to, to clean up because uh, sometimes you not just have plastic but also other stuff out of the wars. So that was an idea and I was so impressed. Uh, they, they did um, a, a place in the, in the, in the first, first five uh, um, uh, rounds uh, they, are, they were not the finalists, but anyway, what I saw is that the young people are really eager and, and encouraged to put their ideas together to really um, manage on, and, and uh, solve those problems we have in the world. So that was my first impression that you, the young generation, has the potential to really bring those ideas up. Uh, we have also um, a project which is called Cleverlinge. That's a joint project with um, uh, also um, a non-for-profit company, Kinderhelden. Uh, it's for elementary school in, in Emmertsgrund. You might know Emmertsgrund is not the best uh, 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 location to, to live in, in Heidelberg. Um, there are really uh, some, some, some families and also children there. Um, who need that help from outside and uh, they have a 70% migration background there and we have SAP mentors who are yeah who taking care for specific uh, uh, children and and they meet once a, a month or they go uh, together uh, to, um, um, to 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 the zoo or to the movies so that they get something uh, in addition uh, to that what they have they have not very much um, we share also our knowledge in, uh, for example, um, um, uh, an event which is called Meet and Code. That's what we can. We, we, can, we can code and we want to share that also uh, with young people. Uh, we are doing so-called hackathons uh, all over the world. Um, here it's the Meet and Code uh, initiated by SAP together with the Stifterhelfen.de and TechSoup Europe. Uh, Stifterhelfen.de is also um, a non-for-profit organization and you can see the facts. So it is something where we really can reach many people and it's not just an event, it's also something which is hopefully sustainable. We have also a very nice uh, volunteering program, uh, the months of service where we help locally. Um, our employees uh, are helping uh, in, in local kindergartens, for example, in renovating, for example, the kindergartens. But we also have a global program. So one of my colleagues was for four weeks in Uganda. And SAP is um, um, uh, taking care for the costs, so uh, he does not need to give, uh, to take the, the, uh, the vacation time, so it is um, that this is working time for my colleague. And he did that, he was in, this, in a school in Uganda and shared his knowledge, uh, which was interesting. Uh, they started to build up an Excel sheet and they were not able to really manage that because it was totally new to them. So our Excel, Excel knowledge uh, was quite interesting for that school. 
So it's some, sometimes it's, it's uh, 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 things which are really, in, in principle, easy for us. And we say, why? why? Why is that the case that they cannot do that? But it helps them a lot. Uh, we have also here a, a nice program connecting employees with purpose. Uh, we have a, a, a global network of volunte uh, volunteer ambassadors, and uh, they help locally uh, in, in uh, non-for-profit organizations. But those uh, programs share knowledge, human and technology resources with others as a kind of donation. But there's also a way to make business with sharing. And the next examples I want to show you uh, are those who are not out of the CSR program, but who are out of our official portfolio, product portfolio. And you can see that even with those um, more business-oriented uh, approaches, uh, we share something. And uh, with uh, sharing something, we can help and we can support some specific aspects. The first one is the so-called open.sap.com. Who knows that? You know that? You know? Uh, you might know that, yes. Um, I, I'm even using that also in my classes um, at the university. What is it? It's a, a MOOC platform. So it's like Ilias. You, you know our um, official uh, uh, platform, which is called Ilias, where you might get your, your slides and maybe the video here, uh, which is um, based on, on that platform, which is university uh, uh, exclusively. Uh, those MOOC platforms are massive open online courses globally available. And we, as a corporate, we have our own MOOC platform, and it's free of charge. And we provide uh, our knowledge on that platform, and it's not just a, a set of slides or a set of uh, documents. No, it's actually classes and, and uh, different curriculas. And you can do that on your own. And by the way, we at SAP, we are using that. So I'm usually once a month on open.sap.com. Uh, um, normally, I'm, I'm teaching myself about new products, new uh, technology. Um, if you need to know what is blockchain all about, go to opensap.com, and you will find uh, a curriculum uh, which shows you in a modern way which you can also um, consume maybe yeah, in, in the tram or uh, 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 at home. Um, and you, you can learn in a, in a modern way. And we provide that uh, with the purpose that we say, OK, knowledge should be available for everyone. But there's also a, a business aspect behind that. So if you share your knowledge and if you increase the community who knows about your products, about how you code, how you develop new applications with SAP, then we increase our community. And then we increase the likelihood that, for example, a startup is using our uh, products and technologies for their own purposes, for their own applications. So if you share the knowledge, then it's not just something where you say, OK, I share it because I, uh, I want to donate you. No, there is a, a meaning behind that. If you increase your community, which has the knowledge how to do some products, how to use it, how to develop, then you increase the likelihood that they use it and take your platform as the basis for their applications. So that's, that's the, the, the main thinking behind that. Another very interesting uh, example is Tugo. Uh, Tugo is a, a ride-sharing platform, and we started internally. So we said, OK, um, there are many, many, many employees from SAP um, taking their car in the morning from Mannheim, because they live in Mannheim, to Waldorf, or from Karlsruhe to Waldorf, or from Heidelberg to Waldorf. Why not sharing? And why not having an app which shows, OK, there is a colleague, and he could maybe uh, um, take with me, and I can just leave my, my car at home. And uh, Tugo started internally. And it was such a, um, a success that we said, actually, it would be good to really provide it also to the public. And we did that, and we failed. 
we failed because it's a totally different story to provide it not just to your employees, but also to everybody. Because it only works if everybody knows about that. But if you want that everybody knows that, you need to do some marketing. And guess what? We had a marketing budget of two go for that approach of 25,000 euros. That's too less, far too less to really get the critical mass of users. And if you don't have enough users, typical platform phenomena, if you don't have enough users who provide a ride, then you don't get the users who use the ride. So we failed to make it public, but we did in the second step a different approach. We said, why not providing that to our customers? And our customers are the BASF, Porsche, Daimler, uh, even internationally, we asked them and said, okay, we solved our sharing, ride-sharing problem internally at SAP with Tugo. Are you interested in? And guess what? They said, yes, that's interesting. And uh, that was the, the next step. So we did that sharing, ride-sharing platform as a product to our customers. And our sales sold it. So it's hard for our sales because it's not very much revenue we did with that, so compared to our other products. But nevertheless, sometimes it was for a salesperson a nice add-on, saying, okay, I, I um, sold you now, or I, um, uh, I give you now, gave you now something for your production or something for your finance. Now I have something very specific where you can do something for the environment. You can lower your carbon footprint uh, by bringing your uh, employees together and uh, do a ride-sharing uh, uh, initiative. And that helps a lot to also show that SAP is not just providing software for business processes, but also for processes uh, uh, above that. So we did that, and we, it's still on our product list. As I said, it's not the, 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 the billion dollar revenue stream, of course not, but it is something uh, which we sell to our customers, and they are using that, by the way, in the cloud. So uh, maybe it's for you it's, it's uh, clear, it must be in the cloud. Um, so it's not something where our customers need to set up. We are setting up that up for our customers. So the next example is something where we saw um, food and uh, food sustainability is a, is a big challenge. And what we observed is that um, the agricultural output needs to double to feed the growing population and to meet the demand for higher value foods. So we have more than 30% of the food produced is lost or wasted. Isn't, isn't that hard to, to see that, those facts? Uh, Agri-production depends on natural resources. It uses 55% of non-forest land, 80% of total fresh water, 30% of fossil fuels, and so on and so forth. So we said, okay, food is a challenge, and we need to help our customers to really get rid of that, uh, that challenge. And we saw that the farm-to-consumer track and trace is not existing. So if you buy something in your supermarket of choice, you might see, for example, on, 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 the, uh, um, um, on, on the beef, you might see, okay, it comes from Germany, and it was slaughtered in Germany, uh, and it was uh, um, uh, packed in Germany, but you don't see more. So there are first approaches where you maybe can put a, a, a barcode and you might see maybe a little bit more, but it is still, still very hard. And the reason for that is it's, it's a very long supply chain. So you don't get it directly from the farmers. Uh, the farmers are um, uh, providing that to, um, to, to uh, companies who are doing the processing into finished products, the fulfillment, the packaging, and so on. Then it goes to the retailers. So it's, it's a long, long supply chain. If you really want to do a track and tracing that you see really where does my beef come from, it's, it's really a challenge. And we started to think of with our customer called Bumblebee. 
And Bumblebee is a retailer in the US, and they are um, selling fish. And um, we said, OK, why not having something where we find out where does the fish come from? And what was the fisher who really did that tuna I have sold now, or I have bought now in my supermarket in the US? And what I will do is I will show you a small YouTube video uh, which we did with Bumblebee, and you see our solution. So here, now you have an example of blockchain beyond Bitcoin. So you can also use blockchain for other purposes. So what's, what's the sharing aspect behind that? If Bumblebee is now doing that just with one fisher, that doesn't make sense, or with, with uh, one supply chain. So Bumblebee needs now to share that technology ideally for all fishers, and not just for all fishers, but hopefully also for all retailers. So it shouldn't be just the Bumblebee specific uh, uh, um, uh, solution, but hopefully a solution for all retailers providing fish. And guess what? Maybe it's not just uh, useful for fish, but also for, uh, for beef and, and for, for, uh, for other stuff. So that that has a potential to really build up a, a, an agricultural platform. But that's actually just the starting point. So we have proved it is working. And now we want to build up a, an ag food agriculture platform. And we want to share that food agriculture platform with all producers and all retailers who are providing uh, agriculture food. And that's a big, big, big challenge. It is brand new, so we did the proof of uh, concept uh, in, in February. What we did in March, uh, we went to one of your colleagues uh, at MIT Sloan School of Management. That was in March, a hackathon, where we asked um, the, the, the master students, please help us to create a business, uh, a, a business model which really helps us to bring that technology into the business. And we, we, we got really great uh, results from, from those uh, four groups um, at MIT. And now we, we try to really make that happen so that we get a platform. And this is not technology anymore. So the technology thing is, is solved. But now it's a business thing. It's, it's, it's a platform play. It's, it's a platform economy uh, challenge. And I tell you that because sharing economy is also connected uh, to platform business. And it's a totally new mindset you need. So it is different uh, having a platform instead just of producing something and selling something. So you compare between having a pipeline business, which is I have a product, I produce that product, I sell that product, that's a pipeline, to the platform business, which is more the orchestration. So I'm not the producer anymore. The producers are others. I just match the production, the, the, the supply, to the demand. And this new thinking is not yet in our, uh, in, in, in our um, uh, economy, so in, uh, in our business. In, in, uh, the companies are still thinking in pipeline. And I want to encourage you to more think of platform economy approaches. Um, I have another example which is very close by. It is the pharma industry. Actually, a, a, a similar pattern. You know, um, uh, products, uh, pharmaceutical products, um, will be sometimes, um, wait a sec, pharmaceutical products are sometimes uh, um, uh, a matter of that you get a, 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 a plagiat of that. You don't get the original one. And what we did is we started to think of how can we use technology to make sure that everybody who's buying or who's getting some medicine knows exactly, OK, that's the original one. It's not a copied thing. It's not something which is not from the original producer. And that's our uh, information collaboration hub for life sciences. It's also blockchain based. And we try to, to set up now that platform with different producers. Also Roche here in Mannheim is one of those producers who are using that. 
But it's, it's much more complicated in life science than in agriculture because you also need to include uh, the government, the institutional databases, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's hard work, and it's also a, a, a sharing aspect that we share that platform, and hopefully we get as much actors as possible into that platform. So um, sharing economy business models are very often platform business models. And here's a recommendation. So if you want to, to think of or want to learn what is platform economy, um, buy that book or go to edX.org. There's a free MOOC of uh, platform economy from Trof Parker uh, uh, from uh, MIT and Marshall van Alstein from Boston University. So they describe uh, very precisely what are the principles of a platform. And if you are thinking, from my point of view, seriously about sharing economy, you need to know what is platform economy. What are the principles of platform business? How can I really set up such platforms? And what is the platform shift from the traditional, conventional approach? So from resource to con control to resource orchestration, from internal optimization to external interaction, from focus on customer value. Yes, yes, you have learned that. Uh, to focus on ecosystem value. Because you not just have one customer, but many customers. You also need to, to serve your uh, supply and not just your demand as an orchestrator. A totally different uh, um, mindset you need. Here are critical capabilities. I want to uh, go a little bit faster so that uh, Christian also gets some time. So further sharing economy business model uh, need those uh, platform business model principles. I hope I could uh, encourage you to really think of platform economy. And now I want to uh, hand over to Christian, who is showing you further examples, which are not out of SAP, but out of our yes, research, out of our activities uh, at the University of Applied Science in Karlsruhe. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. So, as Car Professor Hahn already said, my name is Christian and I'm a research assistant at the Karlsruhe University of Applied Sciences and I'm working for the G Lab there, the Gründerlabor or Founders Laboratory. And I studied the Master's Technology and Entrepreneurship and just finished it a few weeks ago. And this is one project we started during our master's course. Also, Professor Hahn was our mentor and coach in the emphasis of building up a startup, which is kind of a prototype lecture. Yeah, we started it, I started it with three other guys. It's called Heldenruf, or for the non-German speaking guys, I would translate it with call a hero or call a volunteer. We didn't decide on a corporate English name so far, but we started with a problem as well. We found out in different questionnaires and by speaking to nonprofit organizations that there are two problems. One on the side of the people that are looking for voluntary engagement. Sometimes it's time confusing to look for something. Sometimes it's confusing because there's such a big offer. And sometimes it's frustrating because you apply for something, especially I can speak for our cults rural platform, which was already there. There are pretty old stuff up there and you call there and want to help and it's not, it's not online and it's not available anymore. And on the other side, we spoke to big organizations in Karlsruhe, like the German Red Cross, the Caritas or the AVO, and found out that it's also time consuming for them because they have to call people that they maybe have in mind. They find unsuitable candidates sometimes because not everybody wants to make everything and it's little coordinated, so they don't really have a database very often where they save people that already helped and they can, can go back there and see what can they help me. So our solution we provided or we found during the lecture and the project is called Heldenruf and we build up a platform where we wanna find a solution or where we found a solution for the problem and bring those two sides together. So as Professor Hahn already said, it's a platform business and it works the following way. 
when you want to volunteer, you can register with your interests, with your capabilities. Let's say you're good in IT or something, you can tell it to us so we know. And you can also save your availability. So when do you have time? You're just on a weekend or on the weekdays. So we know that. And on the other side, the organizations give us some information about the projects. They're looking for somebody to help them with their homepage. They're looking just for somebody to put some chairs where you're donating blood. So we're going to match those persons because we know when they are available, what they can do, what they want to do. And we give you a message. So we like, yeah, Professor Han, you said you're available. So you want to help because it's more active or it's, I think, you get more motivated if you get a private message than looking for yourself. So this is how a profile looks for us. Just an example. We know that you like animals, maybe. We know that you like the environment. And so we can match those in background. Right now, we're doing that by hand, by, but we're working on the automation of those processes. So we're also looking for a, back-end developer, I don't know. I already heard that there's no people from Wirtschafts Informatik here, so. But if you know somebody that's interested or if you're interested by yourself, just talk to me after the lecture. And yeah, just two weeks ago, we did our proof of concept of first matching. This is Leah, she helped out in the child caring in Karlsruhe. She's reading books to small kids. And what's even more good, she's just starting being a full-time employee, employee there. So the people from the Kinderhaus, it's what it's called, are really happy. And yeah, we want to go on with examples like that because it's good to see that. Yeah, this is our team. And maybe let's talk about how we want to earn money. Sometimes it's not a, not a business we want to earn that much money, but it should be providing enough money to scale it, to run it by ourselves. And so we found out that the nonprofit organizations, they have people that are calling people, that are looking for people, and they have, a, have, have budgets for that. So that's where we want to want to earn money. And on the other side, there's a lot more corporate social responsibility activities like volunteering days and stuff. So this is another example or another topic we want to focus on in the future. Yeah. So we're not in Mannheim already, but you can also register now on heldenroof.org. So when we're coming to Mannheim, we already have some people that may want to volunteer. So thank you for that. And I'm going to continue with two other startups that I'm just representing, but they're coworkers and friends of mine. So I try my best. They sent me some slides. and. Also, Katerina from Epic AI provided a video you will see later. So let's go on with Sahe Solar Engineering. Two of them were part of my course in, in a master's in technology and entrepreneurship. And they're working in Ethiopia. And as the name already says, they're working with solar energy. And just a fun fact, Sahe is the Ethiopian word for sun. So, those are the three founders and a guy from Ethiopia. <laughs> I think that should be pretty obvious. OK, so those guys were working in a program. I don't know if you know it. It's called Engineers Without Borders. It's a very cool project. They're helping all around the world. And they were in Ethiopia, and they saw there's a lot of potential, especially for solar energy, because there are more sun hours, and there's double radiation power. So that's where it all started. And yeah, sorry, the slides are in German, but I'm going to tell you what's on there if you're not speaking English. So also, there are over 50% in Ethiopia without access to energy, to power. And in the rural areas, it's even more. It's 75% almost. But the power problem is just one part of the whole problem because there's also not really access to water, which is really important. So 
they found out that right now the people in the rural areas they're using hand pumps or diesel generators as you can imagine you can't provide that much water with a hand pump for like, thousands of people and on the other hand the diesel generators are polluting the environment they're they're really expensive because you have to get the diesel in the big country it's like three times the German size so yeah and you have a lot of costs so what they saw is that the solar energy is much more is cheaper and in the long run it gets really really efficient compared to the diesel so right now they're focusing on electrifying water providing and what they're doing is special about them they're focusing on mid-sized projects so not the big company where big companies working on the mid-sized project so they're aiming for schools and ambulances so they're doing a lot of consulting and educating the people there because they don't want to fly back to repair something and it makes sense that it's to build it up sustainable so that the people there can fix small failures by themselves so they're working together with the Arba Minch University, for example, to provide knowledge in the areas of solar energy. Okay, this is just some numbers, how many people they already reached. So they're on the next level, I would say, like Head in the Wolf is a really small project. We just had our first customer and those are in the next step, but still learning. Yeah, so the, it's good. I don't know. I want to make some advertisement for our studies. I don't know if you're a master's already, but the technology and entrepreneurship master's has two days for your own projects. So this was helpful for those guys. And it may be interesting that their customers are, on the one side, are nonprofit organizations from Europe that have engagements in Ethiopia. And on the other hand, it's the Ethiopian government. But as you can imagine, Ethiopia is not a really stable country. So right now they're relying on one source of revenue. So they're planning on spreading out to other countries like Kenya or Tanzania. If you want to contact them, they know a lot more. But I hope I could give you a short introduction to what they're doing. And if you're interested, they're always looking for internships and people helping them. So you can contact them. So. Coming to the next startup from Karlsruhe. <laughs> I'm starting with a video. It's in German, but I have some, or Katarina, the founder of the company, provided some English slides as well. So I'm going to show the video first and then catch up with some English slides. Okay. This was Katarina. She's the founder and also a research assistant at the G Lab. So I'm glad she could tell you in detail what she's doing, but I also have the English slides she provided so the basic problem is the insects are perishing so the bees are dying even if there are some people denying it I think it's true and she wants to find out what's the problem for that because we don't know yet so as she already said bees are biosensors for epic AI and because they are flying in the nature and they're coming back to their home every day. So what they did, they built, I don't know, I would say a tunnel where all the bees go through when they come back from their time in the nature and where they are recognized by a camera and get labeled and so they get data, a lot of data and that's where they use AI for. I just can read the text she provided, so that's probably the best. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I try to answer them. Or if you want to add something, Carson. Well, for you, um, you, you might ask, okay, what's the sharing economy aspect? Um, the, the, the bee producers, they have the beehive. And they provide their beehives as kind of sensors. Why should they do that? They, they even have a, a value in that because they know exactly, for example, how many bees are coming out, uh, went out and are coming in. And they also identify um, early enough uh, whether a bee brings in the so-called uh, insect, which is Valroa, 
Um, they are uh, responsible for, um, um, for the, the, the death of the whole beehive. But if they uh, identify that early enough, then they can react on that. So the, the bee producer has an a, a immediate value and they are, uh, uh, yeah, they, they volunteer to provide their sensors and data to Epic AI. So they don't have to pay for the, um, um, for the technology, but they share the data and the data is then the basis for the business of Epic AI. Because as you said, uh, as you've seen, um, uh, one of the uh, customers is that uh, a company who is investigating in, in that area and they uh, get the data and the analysis of the data. So it's, it's a very interesting business model, but also it's a, a platform business model. You need enough beehives to really get enough data that, you, that this data is, is, uh, has a value for other customers who want to pay for that. Thank you. Yeah, as you already saw, this is the pilot project they're doing around Karlsruhe with the different beehives. Yeah, this is also a slide about a pilot project. And in the end, their team, they're growing pretty fast. And right now they're living in a container, which is pretty cool. So if you want to join the team, I also advertise for that. Yeah, I think that's the end of my part. I hand over to you again. Or yeah, just to resolve, yeah, to, to go to the next slide. So just to wrap up uh, what you have seen. So sharing economy is an integral part of the global economy. So it's not something which is a side and there's a normal economy and there's a sharing economy. No, sharing economy is an integral part. And I hope we could show you some uh, practical experience and also some, some best practices out of SAP and also out of our uh, students' uh, uh, community. Corporates share uh, its knowledge and resources uh, for uh, free through CSR programs. Oh, many, many, many typos there, sorry. Um, sharing knowledge can be used to build a community for future ecosystem actors. Uh, sharing economy can be a non-profit or profit approach. Uh, platform economy and platform business model is closely connected with uh, sharing economy. And last but not least, universities and students are a great source for new ideas of sharing economy. And by saying this, I really want to encourage you, uh, go and create ideas in the area of sharing economy and don't hesitate to, to really make that real. Because you, you can see out of those three examples, it really is fun and it, it really helps us to make our world a little bit better. Thank you very much.